Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I don't know, I know people are going to be joining from all over the world. So whatever time zone you're in, welcome to today's webinar, We Are Talks. It's, um, today I think is especially important because we have two remarkable, incredibly accomplished people, Africans, who are in the front lines of helping Africa look at how we respond to the COVID-19 crisis and to help equip our women entrepreneurs, our entrepreneurs, our governments um, with the tools and resources that they need to meet this challenge. Um, so first, let me introduce myself and Women in Africa. My name is Hafsa Tabiola and I'm president of Women in Africa. Um, Women in Africa is a unique organization founded four years ago by a French entrepreneur, Odo Trois. Odo Trois is um, very famous in, within Europe um, for creating several successful businesses, including one called the Women's Forum for the Economy and the Society. This was a platform for leading women, women like Christine Lagarde, very top women and um, men supporting women all over, um, all over the, um, especially in Europe, but also the United States, Latin America. They even had a major delegation from countries of Africa. And when Ode left that company, she was asked by African women to set up Women in Africa to give the African woman the same kind of platform that the Women's Forum gives um, European and American business women. And so she created the Women in Africa um, initiative and she asked me to serve first as ambassador for Nigeria, then as a member of the board, and now as president. So I've been in the role of president of Women in Africa for now two years. And um, we have about 8,000 women entrepreneurs across 54 countries in Africa. We have 800 um, intermediary partner organizations with whom we work. And we have about 100,000, 100,000 followers across different social media platforms. The goal of Women in Africa is to support women decision makers, women leaders, women of high potential across the continent of Africa. We usually do this with summits, with um, different kinds of labs, master classes, mentoring programs, and step by step, we're also looking at ways of financing women entrepreneurs. We have a program that we will actually launch for 2020 next week, where we identify one leading entrepreneur per African country. So we call it We Are 54 for the 54 countries of Africa. And we bring them to um, a physical place we offer training, we teach them how to pitch, how to write a business plan, so that their startups can then become stronger and more established and secure global investors. This year, unfortunately, we will not hold the physical meeting that we normally hold in Morocco. So instead, we will be having a virtual summit, which will be next week on the 26th. And I hope you will be able to join us. Hafez, I see you were able to join us now. So, let me begin to introduce our two incredible um, um, experts today. These are two people that are actually for maybe 15 years or more, I've tracked them, I've followed them, I've admired them. And in the case of Hafez, I consider also a personal friend. Hafez and his wife, Naveen, um, Hafez when he was serving as um, Niger um, the world went to Nigeria with his wife, Nadine, who became a sister and a dear friend. And um, he is just one of those brilliant doers who committed and really did a lot while he served in Nigeria. And then he went on to serve at the FAO, President Agriculture Expert. And now he's serving back at the World Bank as Vice President for Africa. He's actually originally from Egypt. Um, Truly one of those Pan Africanists. And another, the second person we have is Dr. Franny Lotier. And Hafiz also is a PhD, so Dr. Hafiz Gannon. And Dr. Franny Lotier is from Tanzania. She is a brilliant civil engineer, one of actually the most brilliant women I've ever met. 
Um, Dr. Franny Lottier left um, Tanzania as a young woman in her 20s, even just 20 years old, with $17 in her pocket. She landed in Boston, Massachusetts to start to do um, a graduate program at MIT. There she excelled and then she went on to um, work at the World Bank, rising to the level of chief of staff of the um, former World Bank president, Jim Wolfenson, and also even became the president of the World Bank Institute. Um, from there, she um, became executive secretary of the Africa Capacity Building Foundation. She set up her own equity fund called the INCOBE Fund. And now she is at the Trade and Development Bank in, that covers all of Eastern and Southern Africa. So really, I have two stellar people who I know you're going to get, gain a lot of really concrete things because they are doers, they've been doing in Africa and they're doing right now. So perhaps we can begin with you, Hafez. Could you perhaps just give us some opening remarks and give us an overview? What is the impact of COVID-19 on the continent? Um, what kinds of steps have you been taking to address some of the challenges, especially for entrepreneurs, but especially within that for women entrepreneurs? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Hafsat. It's good to see you, even if it's only virtual. So uh, let, let me start by uh, uh, saying, well, uh, I, I wanted to come and, and talk to you today because uh, uh, I'm convinced that well, COVID is, is a major crisis, but I also am convinced that Africa's future will depend greatly on women's empowerment. Unless we liberate and empower African women, we will not be able to achieve uh, long-term development in our continent. So let me start by looking at a little bit about what has COVID done to the uh, African continent. Uh, right now, when we look at it from the health perspective, the numbers are not that huge yet. Uh, we have more than 200,000 cases, about uh, 5,000 deaths, uh, but the numbers are increasing. Uh, uh, and so the, f the first concern that one has in a uh, situation like this is the health concern, is the, how to protect people's lives. The sec so although the, the, uh, Africa has, has so far not been as hard hit, say, as uh, China or Europe or the United States uh, on, on the health side, it has been very hard hit on the economic side. Uh, because uh, the, the impact of, 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 the, uh, 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 of the pandemic on the African economies has been huge. Uh, we expect Africa to go into recession for the first time in 25 years. Uh, we expect uh, that 23 million additional people uh, uh, on the continent will be pushed into extreme poverty. Uh, and wh why, is, why is this happening? This is happening because the commodities that we export, the prices have come down. Uh, there is less for direct investment in t coming into Africa, less uh, remittances. Uh, countries that depend on tourism, like, uh, uh, for example, Kenya or South Africa or Mauritius, have, have lost all of the tourism revenue. And, of course, there's also some capital flight. Uh, so, at the same time, there is also disruption uh, caused by the containment measures. Uh, the fact that uh, we do containment, which is necessary to protect lives, but it, it immediately has an impact uh, on, uh, 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 on jobs, especially uh, since we have 90% of workers in Africa are in the informal sector. Uh, and those are the people who are uh, most uh, impacted. Uh, I have to say, I'm also very worried about how this pandemic is going to affect agriculture and food security in the, on the continent, especially when I look at East Africa, where in addition to COVID, uh, we have a problem with the locusts. Uh, and so we, we are seeing, uh, uh, so the disruption in trade, which would affect imports of food, uh, disruptions in agriculture and in the logistics could have also a negative impact on uh, food security. Uh, uh, so, uh, and it will affect, in West Africa especially, uh, it will affect agricultural exports. Uh, McKinsey 
uh, has issued a report that expect uh, the loss of agriculture exports to be about $5 billion this year. Less exports because, uh, for example, uh, uh, cash that exports uh, from countries like Cote d'Ivoire or Ghana typically go, uh, go to China. If there is less imports from China, so you have a loss there. Now, so this is the general picture, which is, so, uh, uh, is that on the health side, we have not been hit as bad as the other regions in, in the world, but on the economic side, we have probably been hit more than the rest of the world. Uh, and, but the, the impact of COVID, uh, uh, the economic impact of COVID uh, is also not gender neutral. I mean, uh, we, it has had more of an impact, it's having more of an impact on women than on men. And, and, and that is actually typical. We've done similar uh, studies uh, uh, in 2014-16 at the time of the Ebola epidemic. And we found that the impact of Ebola uh, was uh, harder on women than on men. Uh, and let me, uh, and especially on women entrepreneurs. And let, let me explain why. First of all, the women-owned firms uh, tend to have less capital and less financial buffers than men-owned firms. Uh, uh, it, we have data from, using data from 10 African countries, a recent study done at the bank shows that a typically male-owned firm has over six times the capital investment of, uh, of a female-owned uh, enterprise. So obviously, when, when you, uh, if you have less capital, you're also uh, more vulnerable to shocks like the economic downturn caused by COVID. The second thing is, uh, point is that most women entrepreneurs are, uh, uh, work in the informal sector. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, they are mostly concentrated in consumer-facing sectors like services, hospitality, retail trade, and those are sectors uh, that are immediately hit by the decline in consumption caused by uh, uh, the uh, recession and the uh, uh, COVID crisis. The third uh, uh, area also is that uh, uh, we have a large number of the women workers in Africa, 60% to be exact, uh, are in agriculture. So uh, in as much as agriculture is being hit uh, uh, by, by the uh, uh, breakdown in logistics and the, the decline in trade and so on, uh, the women farmers are, are, are being hurt. And, that, and those are 60% of female workers on the continent are in agriculture. Uh, then, uh, finally, the last and fourth point uh, why, why the COVID is not uh, gender neutral is that school closures and confinement measures would increase the burden of care-related tasks. Because now the woman is working, but she, the kids are at school, uh, have left school, and, and, she, uh, uh, and, and she is responsible for that. So that is more burden on women than on men. You add to that, that what we have seen is an increase in gender-based violence during those lockdowns. Uh, and, and that is, uh, it usually happens, unfortunately, during times of crisis, isolation, and confinement. So, uh, so this is how, how uh, this is the situation. This is the impact. Uh, what should we be doing, and what are we trying to do in the World Bank? What should our governments trying to do? And I, I would say that what we need to do is work in three directions. The first one and the immediate one is to protect lives. So governments, and I see that happening across the continent, they put lockdown measures, uh, they, they, uh, they invested in, in strengthening their health systems, uh, they're importing and getting equipment to deal with the COVID respirators, uh, testing uh, equipment and so on. And we at the World Bank and other international financial institutions have been also financing actually over the last uh, uh, two months, we have put in place uh, nearly 40 projects in 40 countries to support uh, the, uh, uh, the health response in Africa. Now, the second direction is to protect livelihoods. And 
the, the, the challenge in our continent is how do we uh, protect the livelihoods of people who are in the informal sector. Uh, 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 and so uh, the, the best approach that we have found that works is rather than trying to look for informal uh, firms and enterprises is to go directly to households. Because in, for those small informal firms, the distinction between the owner of the firm and the firm is, is not very clear. So you go directly to the house of the owner of the firm. And, and we see more and more countries, uh, nearly all our countries have some kind of uh, social protection scheme, some kind of cash transfer scheme. So uh, we, uh, uh, we see more and more countries expanding those uh, schemes, uh, and especially to cover urban areas where urban uh, jobs have been uh, have heavily impacted. Uh, and the World Bank and others uh, have been also helping in financing an expansion in social protection scheme. There is also a need to protect the jobs in the formal sector. So, and for that, many countries are providing uh, 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 liquidity financing. Uh, so, uh, for, for the, especially for the SMEs, for the small firms, we, I, we just finished a, a small survey in Ethiopia, for example, and 70% of the women entrepreneurs said that in order to go through the crisis, they needed more financing, more loans. So, uh, so, that, so that is something that is really important. Uh, we see many programs and projects now that provide financing for the uh, 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 for the SMEs and also that provide uh, uh, guarantees for more financing. Uh, uh, the third area of uh, 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 of uh, action is to try to protect the future. So we said protect lives, protect livelihoods, we need to protect the future. And I, I would like to put two, uh, three areas actually where we need to uh, act. One is uh, this crisis has, has shown and underlined what I always thought was true is that the importance of the digitalization. If we were, if we're not connected today, we would not be able to have this webinar. So uh, it is really, when we say protect the future, one of the important things is we need to invest in uh, the digital economy in Africa. Uh, we need to work, we are working with the African Union now with a vision of uh, having every African connected to the internet by the end of the decade. I think that this is important. Second area about protecting the future is on education. Uh, now schools are closed. Our experience with the Ebola crisis is that many of the kids who left school when schools were closed during Ebola never came back. And that was mostly girls. I mean, the likelihood of boys coming back was higher than the likelihood of girls coming back. So it is really important. I mean, if we want to look at the future and we're worried about uh, gender equality, about the role of women in the economic development in Africa, we have to make sure that the girls go back to school and stay at school. Uh, so, uh, uh, so action to make sure that the girls are going back to school and are staying at school uh, is, is important for protecting the future. The third area is on the health side. What we are seeing, which is really worrisome, is as the health systems are concentrating on dealing with COVID, many other things that like routine immunizations are not being done. And we are already seeing uh, uh, old diseases that uh, are coming back, like measles uh, 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 and so on. So this this are the area. So uh, I, I should stop here. Let me stop here. Thank you again for the opportunity to talk to you. It's a pleasure to see you, Hafsat, but I'm sure you also uh, want to listen to Freddy, who must have a lot of interesting things to say. And I'll be happy to answer questions later on. Does you and Franny know each other? Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> I, we we do. You, all the best people know each other. So Franny, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Hafsat, uh, for inviting me for this important webinar. And it's really great that uh, Hafez has given this uh, overview, which allows me perhaps to drill deeper into the question of women entrepreneurs and the role that multilateral development banks can do working with sovereigns and, pri and the private sector. 
So the first area which struck me when you look at what COVID-19 has done to women entrepreneurs in Africa is how it has differentially impacted them compared, as Hafez has said, to male-owned or male-led companies. And the first is because the majority of women entrepreneurs are in what is uh, 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 driven by face-to-face -face marketing and face-to-face -face engagement. So social distancing, lockdowns, curfews, all of the measures that have been taken across different countries have been particularly damaging to the ability of women-owned companies to actually market themselves, reach their clients, and offer their services. Now, within that, there is an, an innovation that has grown because those women who are able to use mobile uh, systems, communication systems, and the internet have actually transformed their businesses quite rapidly and have put in place digital marketing and opportunities to reach beyond their own borders. And a positive side effect of this is that they now have markets outside of Africa, which is a very good uh, outcome of a crisis. But the crisis remains, and I want to join Hafez in the comments that he has made that digital inclusion becomes one of the most important things that can help address this gap but also measures that help the, the women who at the moment don't have electricity in their households. Therefore, even if you give them digital access, they won't be able to participate in that economy. The second key area is one that has to do with working from home. And here I'm really happy to state that uh, a lot of women-owned enterprises that have been ran from women's homes have now become the role model for those who have to work at home on how to balance work and life. So there is a positive element in that because women have been multitasking for a number of years for those who are running their companies from home, but they do have the extra challenge of having to worry about healthcare. And in countries across Africa where the traditional healthcare systems where your mother and your cousin and, and, and nieces come to help take care of the children have been disrupted, particularly in the urban areas, those women are having a very difficult time meeting healthcare and, 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 and childcare needs, particularly because in some households, for example, in order to reduce the risk of infection, they have asked whatever help they have not to be engaged during this COVID process so that they can uh, keep the households safe and not too much back and forth between um, different houses in order to maintain social distancing. So that has been an extra burden on women CEOs, for instance, who now have another extra role to cook, to clean and take care of children, which previously they were able to rely on somebody they could hire to do that. Um, the third uh, area is uh, health. And here I was quite struck because a number of my women entrepreneur friends uh, in particular life situations where they are pregnant or have just had a, a child and the COVID-19 risks on pregnant women and, and, young, and women who have just had a, a baby are very severe, inability to go and get the traditional care that you would need. And then of course, since health access was already quite a challenge, this is becoming a, a serious constraint and it's, it's impacting women of all levels, whether rural women, women working in the informal sector, or, or high income and highly educated women who still have to uh, look for access during these very difficult times. So it's one of the important equalizing factors that if sold then for a group of entrepreneurs can actually be a solution for all women. And here I would like to say that the solutions that have been tested previously like telemedicine, are becoming very important because we had used those, for instance, in a number of areas, Nigeria being one of them where you can give um, information on how to self-inject uh, yourself with insulin for those who are suffering from diabetes, and that comes through an app on WhatsApp or another messaging system. So that has become now even more important in order to deliver messages. And here there is a risk in particular in Africa because as you know, a lot of misinformation and fake cures have been also going on those same networks. So there's a need also to have a parallel system with the right information riding on those networks. Then there is the fourth issue, which is the 
dependence of women entrepreneurs on solutions for the informal sector and SMEs, as Hafez has mentioned. Uh, many of them are having a lot of difficulty with liquidity. They have a different, different challenge with, on the capital side, but liquidity is one of the key risks because they tend to be sort of daily revenue earning type activities. So if you cut off the client base, it immediately hits on the liquidity side and they, are, they have no access to working capital and therefore no opportunities to even uh, tread water during the crisis. And therefore all the solutions that uh, Hafez has mentioned, whether it's direct transfers, uh, special solutions to SMEs, including blockchain uh, platforms that can secure transfers between buyers and sellers and pair up with government systems to put liquidity into those companies would be very, very welcome. And a lot of innovation is taking place already in that space. The last area I wanted to talk about is the impact that disrupted supply chains have had particularly on women entrepreneurs. Uh, first, with the global uh, markets. Usually, if there were high-end entrepreneurs, they were having markets outside of Africa. If you take the example of Gahia Links in Rwanda, they were exporting these baskets to, to Hollywood and other places, Saks Fifth Avenue, and all those chains now have been disrupted. So the opportunity to earn income from an export of a high-end handmade product was, uh, was taken away. And at the same time, Africa is still building its regional integration and, and opening up markets for one country to trade with another. So the disruption in the supply chains, not only locally uh, because of the social distancing and confinement measures, but also internationally because of the disruption in global supply chains, whether it's shipping, aviation, and, and other sectors. So the good news here is that a number of airlines, like Ethiopian Airlines, Rwanda Air, and so on, have immediately come up with uh, 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 cargo-based solutions. So even though people are not traveling, they've made that extra capacity available for goods. So you can see, for example, you are able to export fresh fish from uh, Lake Victoria in Mwanza in Tanzania, to Europe and Europeans now can enjoy fresh fish coming from the lake because Rwanda Air is able to, to offer that cargo service. So we, and within that there are opportunities because a lot of those jobs, the fishermen are, men, are the fisher people are men and the people who process the fish and carry them to market are many times women. So women entrepreneurs in that fishing business have an opportunity now for a global market. So these are key areas, and I think the solutions that uh, Hafez, Hafez has mentioned, uh, liquidity for SMEs is absolutely critical, supporting regional transformation, which requires regional infrastructure like roads, customs procedures, and so on, which are the major reform areas that MDBs like the World Bank and others have been uh, pushing. And of course, the Trade and Development Bank has been financing trade finance and regional infrastructure over a number of years. Uh, being able to immediately support access to credit, uh, supporting financial institutions that lend to SMEs, because they also now are having problems because the SMEs are unable to meet their loan repayments and it's creating a crisis in the financial sector. So by supporting the financial institutions, you can actually get uh, some impact on the women-owned uh, enterprises. On the health side, beyond telemedicine, perhaps to come up with special services for pregnant women. I think this is urgent. And as the infection rates increase in Africa, I think we don't have a lot of time uh, for that aspect. So it is very, very important. And on the working from home uh, to help uh, create opportunities for safe spaces where women can go for shelter in the case of domestic violence, but also where they can go for co-working with social distancing uh, that allows them to get out of the house where it's already quite crowded and they can work outdoors or in open air with a, a shelter covering for sun and rain, which will give opportunities for uh, activities to go on. And the final solution is to really push forward something that the World Bank during my days there, and uh, Hafez and I worked quite closely on that when he was in Ghana, Nigeria, Madagascar, and other places, which is distance learning and continuous learning. I mean, this was started a dec uh, two decades ago by the World Bank, 
creating the African Virtual University, creating uh, uh, the Global Development Learning Network and so on, which were video-based technologies for learning and exchanging ideas. Those lessons are incredibly important for everybody today and not just for the universities and the executives who are exchanging at that time. Thank you. Thank you both Afez and Franny for your excellent opening remarks. I would actually, um, you know, Afez, after I married your friend, we moved to China. And in China, there was this interesting saying that um, the, um, one of their leaders said, he said, the Chinese people, because there were already, I think, over a billion of them, he said, our population is neither an asset nor a liability. It depends on what we do with them. You know, and I think now about Africa with 1.3 billion people and with 60% of our people being under 30 years old, Africa has this huge opp opportunity to have a demographic dividend, which is that we have so many more people at an age in which they should be the most productive. And that could be a huge wealth generator for the continent if there was a lot that those young people could do. Afiz, I read, you know, and the last week, Christina, your, assist, your executive assistant was so kind to give me your human capital development plan that you've come up with for the continent of Africa, which is to address this issue of the cap capabilities of our young people, of all our people on the continent. Could you share with us what this plan is, how it's been executed, and, you know, how people can participate in it? Okay, yes, thank you very much, Hafsat. It's an important question. You know, uh, we, we at the World Bank, we, we calculate something that we call the Human Capital Index, which is a composite that uh, uh, is basically, uh, it measures the education attainment and the health uh, attainment of, of, of the population in different countries. And Africa is at the bottom, uh, the, the 10 lowest countries uh, we, uh, on this uh, on the scale of uh, human capital happen to be uh, in in Africa, so uh, we have been scratching our heads and trying to figure out why. Uh, when you look at the at some of the elements of that index, we see things like uh, stunting rates, Sh children, the very high rates of stunting, uh, more than one third of our children are stunted which means in some countries it's, uh, it's even higher, it's 45% of children who are stunted. This means that those children will never reach their full capacity, mental and physical. So obviously, uh, how can we compete uh, and develop uh, if we are stunted? Uh, and of course, then there is edu uh, the education, uh, long, uh, the life expectancy, and all those figures are wrong. And, and we tried to, we're looking at some of the drivers of this. And one of the most important drivers actually is, is, is what I would call the women empowerment. That an important driver is, is the fertility rate. Uh, uh, one of our biggest problems is that across the continent, uh, uh, we, we marry our girls too young. So you, you, you have actually children are having children. And so if the mother is very young and weak, if she has not finished her education, so she does not know how to feed her child, we, 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 we end up obviously with problems of, uh, uh, of, of children who are stunted. Uh, we, we don't finish the uh, education and we get very poor health outcomes. So one of the key areas where we are focusing our work, as I said before, is, is on women's empowerment. What does this mean? It means that we, we, we want uh, our girls to stay at school. We want to avoid child marriage. So we have projects that focus on, on girls' education, uh, on avoiding uh, child marriage. And, and after marriage, we want uh, uh, our women to be able to, uh, to, to work and, and to produce normally. Now, uh, I, I keep telling people that I am a feminist, uh, and I tell them I'm a feminist not uh, not because my mother is a woman, my wife is a woman, my daughter is a woman, but I'm a feminist because I'm an economist, and uh, the the gender inequality is a huge loss 
uh, to the economy, to, to, to the country, uh, to, to our countries. So you, you can calculate in, in, in the countries uh, uh, in, in, in Africa, uh, the differential between, if we calculate women's productivity in Africa is roughly one third less than men's productivity. And that is not because the women are not capable. It is because they don't have the liquidity and the capital to work with. They, they're not given access to the technology. They don't have the education. Now, if we invest in, in, our, in our girls so that they have the same level of productivity as, as, as the men, you, you can increase per capita income on the continent by at least 25%. So you, you can do a lot in terms of reducing poverty and improving the hum, human capital. So that is an important aspect of, uh, of, uh, uh, of our work, is in investing in, in, uh, in, in women, especially in girls' education, uh, avoiding uh, child marriage, and providing opportunities for women to work and be productive uh, in, in the economy. Thank you, Hafez. Um, Franny, you used to work with the World Bank Institute. You used to lead that organization, which is also related to this question of human capital development. Could you say some something, um, a few um, insights that you have about how we can actually help the women entrepreneurs in Africa? Because we often say within um, the women in Africa ecosystem, very proudly, that African women entrepreneurs lead the world of women entrepreneurs because 26% of women entrepreneurs around the world are from Africa, which is the highest proportion anywhere in the world. And, um, but we also lead the world of women entrepreneurs in, in the ratio of uh, th those whose businesses fail, which I think part of the challenge is the capital that you've mentioned, the liquidity that you've mentioned, but also the skills that many of our women entrepreneurs don't have the skills that they need to succeed. What can we do to really bridge this gap in a systematic way to actually address the challenge? Uh, that's an excellent question, Hafsat. And let me just start by saying that uh, the skills development for entrepreneurs is an area that uh, has gained a lot of attention in recent years because it has shown results. So if you take, for example, apprenticeships, mentorship, and direct training of entrepreneurs, those have delivered huge impacts in terms of ability to uh, generate productivity gains and also access new markets and turn around small companies to go onto a growth path. Uh, so there are a number of examples that are working very well. So if you start with the high level area, the joint program between Harvard and MIT called EDX, which offers online learning for anybody uh, in the world at an affordable price. You can join that program. And when you do, you are also able to join uh, solutions that, for example, called Solve, that allow you to meet other entrepreneurs, funders, uh, people who can help you with technology solutions and so on. So as an entrepreneur, you are not only learning, but you're at the same time gaining an ecosystem of mentorship, financial support, and so on. And so these kind of combined learning, mentoring, and financing solutions are becoming very important to support entrepreneurs around the world, and for women in particular, because for the longest time, distance learning has been something that women have been doing, because usually they would drop out of school because they had a baby, or they were unable to complete beyond their bachelor's degree because they got married, moved to another location, and so on. And so their ability to benefit from distance learning is absolutely critical, but it's even more critical for accessing the right content, which is entrepreneurial uh, uh, development, ideas, entrepreneurial management, and this ecosystem of mentors and financiers. The second area, which again is absolutely critical, has to do more with ability to have uh, embedded within the support to SMEs and the informal sector, three critical capabilities. The first one is advice on structuring companies and then capital raising, which can be either through debt or equity or other solutions, including grants, which help small enterprises to grow. 
But then there is a middle part, which is helping companies develop their governance structures, get themselves registered, pay taxes, and be able to develop uh, strategies to reach new markets. And that critical piece is also equally important and it combines assessment, but also learning. And you know, once you can get SMEs rated, for example, which is a big area that's growing now in, in terms of giving SMEs rating so that people who fund them can know what level of risk they're taking, that goes along very well with this kind of assessment and, and uh, formalization of the informal sector. And then the third bit, which is equally important, is then technical assistance and capacity building. Uh, because SMEs need continuous ideas. They, they need continuous learning. They need to have the right learning at the right time and in, done in modules so that while they are working, they can also learn and they don't have to take a whole year off to, to go and do uh, formal studies. So I think those areas are very critical. And then maybe I'll say the third key block, which is equally important and it comes from our experience at, at the World Bank Institute during my days there, is that if you are able to combine policy makers to sit in the same space as entrepreneurs, you get tremendous results. So if you take the program that we ran out of the World Bank Institute jointly with Harvard Medical School that brought in the ministers of health from different countries and they sat together and they were able to hear the issues that are being uh, 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 confronting, that are confronting entrepreneurs, they were better able to go back home, shape health policy and shape education policy to support those entrepreneurs. And one offshoot of that, which I'm very proud of, is a colleague that we worked with on that uh, at the World Bank Institute, uh, Dr. Egbe Dawudu Osifu, who is now uh, back in Nigeria, went and launched her own mobile health company. And so it showed that you can go from learning, engaging policymakers with medical experts and entrepreneurs, and then go out and actually launch your own enterprise. And I think if we get these three pieces right, we will be able to support women entrepreneurs, even in the most difficult circumstances. Thank you, Fanny. Um, Hafez, I was wondering, you know, within the women in Africa world, we keep hearing from our entrepreneurs that their big struggle is access to financing. But the only options they have are the microfinance banks, which charge a very high credit, but even for two small sums of money for the level of women entrepreneurs that we work with, or the commercial banks, which for some reason for them, the things that they require from the women entrepreneurs, often women entrepreneurs don't have like this land titles, collateral. I'm talking about even very successful women. They don't have these things. So we've begun to look at the area of mesofinance, which is a growing area. And I don't know if you within the World Bank have been looking at this as a way and, and trying to see what kind of policies governments can take to encourage the emergence of this sector so that they can, so they can thrive in the way that now we have all over Africa, we have microfinance banks. But the, the missing middle for the continent requires the right financing mechanism, which doesn't exist. No, uh, uh, yes, uh, you, you are right, and it's, it's an important issue. But before I get into that, I want to just make one point to add, in addition to what Franny said or, or, or on the training and education on entrepreneurship. One area that we have found is really important uh, for women entrepreneurs in, in Africa in particular, is what we call personal initiative training. So it is not just enough to, uh, uh, to, to take lessons, to, to get an MBA or uh, lessons in finance and so on. What is important also is often we find that the women entrepreneurs are less proactive and less persevere than men. It is uh, part of the culture sometimes that the, uh, the woman is not as aggressive if, if you wish. And uh, uh, we have tried in several countries uh, providing this personal initiative training. And, and, and the results are amazing, uh, actually, that uh, women increase the re uh, the, their incomes just, uh, uh, as a result of this training. So this is something to, th to think about uh, as, as part of developing entrepreneurship. Now, back to, to, to your point, Hafsat, uh, on, on, on providing liquidity 
uh, at financing, which is which is critical for, for us at, at the bank. And you're right, we need to, uh, to find this means of financing. We're, we're working more and more. We're, we're putting in place projects in countries like in Ethiopia. We have a project that we're putting together uh, uh, on women entrepreneurship development project, which is a, a hundred million dollar project, which would provide a rescue and recovery packages to women entrepreneurs suffering from the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, that, that is in Ethiopia. In other places, as, as you rightly pointed out, also have said, uh, the issue offered is that uh, uh, w women do not have the guarantees, they, especially uh, they don't have the land titles that, that the banks re require to provide the laws. So another approach that, that we're using, for example, in Burkina, uh, Burkina Faso, is, is to provide, uh, is to put in place a guarantee scheme. So to, to uh, so that uh, a woman can come, uh, can use this project to provide, uh, to provide a guarantee to the bank, uh, replacing the uh, land title. So th those are the kinds of uh, uh, interventions that, that uh, uh, th that uh, we we are doing, they have to go hand in hand with the kind of uh, training and education that uh, uh, Franny has been talking about, uh, because it is it is uh, really uh, uh, important also to uh, for for the world to uh, to get the uh, the training in the financial on the financial side uh, uh, in order to be able to manage the relationship with their lenders and so on. So let, let me uh, uh, let me stop here. Thanks. So I have so many questions still to ask, but I, I think because of the time, uh, maybe we could have um, maybe another. How long do you have for us, both of you, before you have to go? Ten minutes. Ah, no, Arthur, Arthur, you did not come at exactly four o'clock. You came at like. <laughs> You had problems, I know, connecting, but can you not give us till 10 past five? Uh, 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 that's because you are my friend and my former neighbor, I would give you, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Franny, can you also till, um, because we still have quite a few questions. So now I want to, um, I think I'll ask um, Franny. Let me see the question for Franny. Franny, we have a question from Senegal, from Rama Jallo. She says, we often speak about supporting women entrepreneurs. How about women as fund managers? She says, until we African women sit at the tables where decisions about capital allocation are made, it will be harder to truly support more of the ventures that women will start because they will have identified opportunities that men who run the funds can't relate to and therefore don't invest in. How, um, how are you working to address this um, gap? Uh, thank you for that question from Rama in Senegal. I think you've asked a really critical question because uh, the studies have shown that if you have women on your board, if you have women in CEO and other leadership roles, or if you have women who make financing decisions, either as fund managers or managers in banks and other financial institutions, you get much better outcomes for women entrepreneurs. So I think this is a very good question. So what are we doing about that? Uh, the first effort that we have uh, is something that was started when I was at the African Development Bank uh, called the Affirmative, Act, Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa, AFAO. And this was an initiative launched when uh, Geraldine Frazier Moriketti was at uh, the African Development Bank. It came up with a financial solution along with a number of founding partners who made sure that women entrepreneurs can actually get access to finance because there's a team of women who are looking at their funding proposals and making decisions about them. They then go through the, the entire internal approval process, including the board of the bank, in order to be approved. And that has been an, an amazing uh, uh, transformation in terms of the way decisions get made. But the second thing, and this relates to the point that Hafez has made about being a feminist, even though he is a man, but clearly he's a feminist because of his economic knowledge. This idea of a power 
got immediate support outside of the African Development Bank. You have the president of the Trade and Development Bank, who is a guy who took up this idea. And uh, now TDB has a platform for financing SMEs that is a joint program between TDB and the African Development Bank where you give funding to uh, uh, women, uh, women managed or owned banks. So we have one in Ethiopia, which is a women's bank. We have one even in Burundi where the situation was very difficult there. You had a women's bank that was doing extremely well and able to lend to women owned SMEs. And then the third thing that we're doing is on the recruitment side. So wherever you go, if you are in a job and you have a role to recruit either staff members, uh, managers or board members, you can exercise that role by giving a broader look on diversity to make sure that those governance structures and leadership structures have women. So I'm happy to say on one of the board that I sit, we just made a decision to transform that board, which we have done now in three recruitments, we have made it majority women on the governance structures from a period before where there were no women on the board. And similarly, if you look at where I'm, I am at uh, TDB, I'm leaving TDB at the end of this month to join Southbridge. That's why you have Southbridge uh, there uh, as a senior partner. So at TDB, 50% of the leadership team are women. Uh, so that is, a, I think, a very important signal to say that if you get diversity in your team, you can make decisions that are sensitive to the issues that are faced by women. And therefore, this is a very important uh, area to, to work on. I think it is personal, but it's also institutional. And through a great effort, we were able to find fantastic women to sit on boards and to get others that you can mentor and train uh, to be able to uh, assume those uh, governance positions. Thank you so much, Fanny, um, for that very comprehensive response. And um, Hafez, um, we have a question, this time from Nigeria, from Aisha Damu, who, as, um, who is listening as we are um, and to the webinar. She's asking about women in rural, in the rural communities, which I think is an especially important question. Actually, Fanny, that's where you were born and raised, in rural Tanzania. And a lot of Africa's development has been so urban centered, you know, and, um, and I think that's not, it hasn't been so good for the continent that way. Um, she's asking, what are the efforts being made to help the women in rural communities? What access do they have to benefit from the World Bank efforts on agriculture? Before you answer that question, Afiz, I just want you to know, Franny, because I noted that you were on the board, you are on the board of OCP Africa which is um, the largest phosphate fertilizer company in the world. And I, I, I'm just today, my state, I'm from Ogun State in Nigeria, they sent me a video, the commissioner of, for agriculture sent me a video because OCP has done, has, um, sent, um, has provided 10,000 units of fertilizer, motorcycles for extension service workers, um, so much support for agriculture because of the global, um, the impact, the, the crisis in agriculture that Hafez was talking about because they're trying to be proactive. So I want you to know, Fanny, that even earlier today, I already cried, but tears of joy. Because when I saw that video, when I saw those things going to our farmers, I cried because when I see all the reports about what Africa is facing, I just feel we need beyond words, we need action. And I just want you to know that your, your um, or, um, company is doing an incredible job on the continent. I know they're doing it in many countries across the continent, including also in Ethiopia. I don't know, I know in Nigeria, in Gambia, I don't, you, you must know all the countries where OCP Africa is now, but it's just wonderful. And we need more companies like this to step forward. So Hafez, the World Bank Group, what are you doing to make sure that we're not going to be starving that our women farmers will be productive and prosperous? Yes, uh, no, that's a very important question because as I said before, 60% of, uh, uh, of the women in Africa uh, work in agriculture. So uh, dealing with, the, uh, uh, with that and supporting women in agriculture and supporting farmers in general uh, should, should be a top priority. Uh, we need it 
because of the gender aspects, helping the women. We need it also because most uh, in Africa, most poverty is in rural areas. And we need it because uh, we, we need to ensure food security in Africa. Af Africa depends a lot on imports, which is for food uh, security, which is fine, but you also need to have more of your own uh, production. Now, what, we're, what, what are we doing? At, uh, at the country levels, we have we have projects in most, in most of our countries, uh, uh, agricultural projects, and especially uh, we, we do what we call uh, community development projects. So th those are uh, projects uh, in, uh, uh, that support uh, small farmers that, that are based on providing the small the smallholder farmer with uh, with funding for investments. They decide what what is needed. Uh, in Nigeria, the best example of this project is the Fadama project. Fadama. Uh, is a project that supports uh, smallholder agriculture in Nigeria. Uh, it is not a project that is just focused on women. It, it is it, it is a, a rural development project in general, uh, an agricultural project, but with women being an important uh, 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 part of the project. Now, it is important for people designing those agricultural projects and for implementing them to be gender sensitive. Uh, because uh, uh, depending on, on, on which crops you support, it will be uh, uh, it is not gender neutral because some crops are mostly produced by women, others are mostly produced by men. So you, you need to go and uh, uh, and see what are the women producing, what, how can you uh, help them uh, 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 and, and support them. Uh, you also uh, need, uh, what, what we do with those types of projects is to listen to the women. You have to listen to them and, uh, and understand their, co their constraints, which is often different from that of, of, uh, of men. Uh, uh, the, the women do not have access to the same quality land as men. So you, you need to look at the issue of access to land. Uh, you, you need to give voice to, to the woman farmer, and then you need to finance that. Uh, I talked about the Fadaba project in in, in in Nigeria. I was in a in a country with a similar name, Niger. I was in Niger uh, three months ago. I'm visiting uh, uh, also an agricultural project that the bank is financing, and it was really very impressive because all the beneficiaries were women, and it was. And in this very, very conservative country, uh, uh, we saw, I saw all of those uh, women driving tractors uh, 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 and doing jobs that until recently, uh, in, in, in the mind of people there, were really men jobs. So it, it, it was really uh, uh, very, very uh, impressive. And often it is also women helping women. So uh, one woman who got a truck and learned how to drive it, and then starts sharing it with her uh, uh, colleagues and neighbors. That, that is very important. One last point that I would like to make on agriculture is that uh, in Africa, we are heavily impacted by climate change. Uh, we, we see uh, increasing desertification. Uh, we, we see incre uh, uh, increasing uh, extreme weather conditions. In some countries, we have droughts, and then next, the following year, we have flooding, and so on. So it is important, what, what we are also doing, working across, this is a, a, a continent-wide uh, initiative, working with all of the ministers of agriculture across Africa, is uh, to see how we can use modern technology to make African agriculture more, more resilient to climate change, and to make African agriculture more productive. And th that would be important also, also especially for the uh, women farmers. So let me stop here. So I think we would start to round up. I actually, um, there was one more question that came in from Madagascar. Um, unfortunately, I can't even really take any of the questions that have been, there's so many questions that have come in. But what we'll do is we'll send, um, I'll send to Dr. Lottier the questions that um, have come in that I, for you to answer, and then to Christina for you, Dr. Hafez. 
so that you can then, whenever you have a chance, you can just send me some responses and we'll let the members have them. But this um, question came in from Madagascar, and this is an incredible woman entrepreneur. She's the first Malagasy person, not just woman, to have won an oil bid, um, to own an oil block in our country. So a pioneer. She actually also went to MIT like you, Franny. So um, she says she's having trouble financing, as you can imagine, oil, the oil sector is so, so capital intensive, financing our projects. And she asks for advice. She said, would you please give me any advice, suggestions or strategy that could help me to raise the necessary fund to complete the work program and start the production? So Franny, do you have any advice for, let me tell you, her name is Dr. Emma. Uh, thank you for the question from Dr. Emma. I think the, the oil sector is having particular challenges now because a number of funders and countries in, and also organizations, including the World Bank, IFC, have stopped financing fossil fuels. And so that becomes, becomes also very complicated for anyone who owns those kind of assets. But within uh, Africa itself, uh, fossil fuels, whether it's oil or gas, are seen as very critical for Africa's industrial transformation. And therefore, the sources of funds that you may wish to look for uh, should be coming from African institutions. So you could look at uh, AfriExim Bank, uh, the Trade and Development Bank, the African Development Bank, and also looking at pension funds and other sovereign wealth funds in Africa that have appetite for fossil fuels. So maybe through this link, uh, I, I'll be happy to connect you. We, we have a, an office in, uh, in uh, Mauritius that covers uh, Francophone Africa from there, and Madagascar is covered under that, uh, that office, and I'll be very happy to connect you to the coverage officer there. Thank you. So Dr. Emma, I'll send you an email with um, Dr. Franny Lottier's um, contact so you can get in touch with her. Um, so Hafez, when you think in your own dream world, because I know what you're doing is having such huge impact, but sometimes you must feel like if only um, people in Africa would organize in this way, we could have so much more impact. Could you guide us in Women in Africa? What kinds of things should we be doing as an association that is really in 54 countries across Africa and is really committed to the kinds of issues that you've talked about? What should we be doing to really help you to deliver more and to really help also our governments that you interface with to really um, have the outcomes that we all want? Well, uh, that's a, a, a very, a difficult question, Hafsad, because you're already doing a lot. Uh, and I, I think what what you really, uh, uh, for me, the two big priorities. The, the first priority is to give voice to the women in Africa. As, uh, and I know you're doing that, Hafsad, and, and in Nigeria, this is uh, working quite well. I think we need to do it ac across across the continent. Uh, I mean, the, the question on women not being a, a, in the uh, uh, fund managers, uh, that was an interesting question. We need to push uh, uh, at the political level uh, with the policy makers, with, with the leaders, uh, to have uh, to, to uh, focus much more uh, on women issues. Uh, I have to tell you, I mean, I, I, in my job, I have the privilege of meeting with many African leaders, many heads of state, and and as uh, and I always raise the uh, uh, the gender issues, the women empowerment issues with them, and I actually I find them all very very receptive. They're all very very receptive. In some countries, I. I the, the leader would be receptive, but he would tell me, "Oh, but you know, uh, it is we we are such a conservative country. If I go out and say this and that, I will get a backlash." So it, it has to be people like you, who who take the leadership role and to push uh, for uh, women's uh, voice. And uh, by the way, when you do that, you, it's not, you're not just empowering women; you're actually also empowering the men. Uh, uh, and improving the lives of women and of men uh, uh, doing that. The second area that I really think is extremely important is the education for girls. 
the I mean, we can talk about women empowerment and uh, women entrepreneurs, but if they are, don't have the basic education, uh, uh, we, we will, they won't be able to go too far. So uh, I, I'm, I'm really convinced that uh, just prov making sure that all the girls stay at school until at least they finish secondary education it, it, it should be our goal in Africa. And, and that is something that we should be pushing for. And then they can be entrepreneurs, they can be mothers, they can stay at home, but they would at least be free to make their own choices and their own decisions. And I think that this would be very important. Thank you, Hafsat. And any closing remarks, Dr. Hafiz? Because I know you have two minutes, you have to go, and Franny has to go as well. So maybe you make your concluding remarks now. Because next time that I call on you in about maybe a few months, six months, for us to do a review, I don't want Christina to ignore my email. So I want to make sure we keep <laughs> No, no, uh, she won't ignore your emails. Uh, 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 but uh, no, uh, no. Actually, my, my only closing remarks is that first of all, thank you very, very much for uh, for inviting me. It's it's a it's a real pleasure to be here, and it's a real pleasure to be with you, Hafsat. It's a real pleasure to be with uh, my friend and colleague uh, Franny, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, it's an honor. Uh, I think what you are doing is extremely important. Uh, as I said, it's important for the women in Africa, but it's important for all Africans, men and women. And so and I wish you all of luck and anything that we can do from the side of the World Bank uh, to support you and to help you, uh, you, you know you have a friend there. Thank so, you. Thanks a lot. And say hi to Nadine. I, I will, I will. So Franny, you have the closer, you have the floor to ground out our conversation today. Well, thank you very much, Hafsat, for inviting me. And uh, it was a pleasure to meet you virtually and to see you after, since the, the last World Economic Forum in Cape Town, I think, uh, which is when we last met. And it's fantastic to see Hafiz also as usually sharp and uh, to the point and bringing uh, great innov innovative ideas to the table. Uh, I take away three things from this uh, conversation today. Uh, the first one is that you are on the right track because you've always identified women in Africa as a top issue and you've given your personal and professional time to it. And I think continuing to do what you are doing, linking the different worlds, uh, linking African women with women outside of Africa and bringing ideas and exchanges from across the world uh, so that African women can share what they do and they can also learn from others. So I think you're doing an amazing job on that. So please do keep on doing that because it's, it's, a, it's giving a great platform for these issues. The second is I think the, the, the importance of the financial sector in supporting women entrepreneurs. And that's not only in providing access to capital, supporting their liquidity and working capital challenges in particular, but also hearing them as entrepreneurs so that they can see the kind of innovation that is being brought to the table, they can recognize it and they can support it. And then related to that is this issue of reducing the number of failed businesses that are women owned, which you mentioned at the start, uh, Hafsat, is one of the areas that concerns us uh, because women owned companies fail at a higher rate than uh, male owned companies. So how to target that sector and give uh, capacity building, technical assistance, finance, and solutions in terms of structuring and risk management. And then the third thing uh, that uh, is really critical is looking at it from a cradle to grave perspective. From the time a woman is carrying a baby to get proper health care so she can have a healthy child, the education of girls, and then the support through continuous learning into adulthood. I think that approach is very critical. And I want to thank you once again for ha having this incredible uh, seminar for us to talk about these issues. And wonderful to see both you and Hafez uh, on the screen. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to close out and say thank you to Hafez. Thank you to Franny. Thank you for the way in which wherever you go, you represent the continent in just the best way. You're brilliant, you're articulate, you have integrity, you're prepared, and you always stand up for us. I've seen you in so many conferences. The last time I saw Hafez 
was at the Rockefeller Foundation event in New York at the time of the, um, the UN General Assembly just last September. And yet again, he was in one of the leading sessions on the um, sustainable development goals, pressing for the continent, pushing forward our agenda. And you are the same, Franny, in every event, from the first one where I met you, which was about maybe six years ago, where um, it was this, um, this Swiss, Swiss forum. Um, what's it called? It has a name, but I can't remember now. But you were so articulate and so clear and brilliant. And you've always been in every space that I've seen you. You've always been that way. You know, the continent, I really believe, as I know you both do, that it's our time now. And I feel deeply honored by the way you've moved into the world. And, and that's why I felt you needed to come into our community for people to see you and hear you and know that they have allies and champions. So we know that as we, as our women entrepreneurs are working, that you are partnering with them. They may never see you physically because you work through intermediary organizations, but your work is having an impact. So for all of that, we thank you. And we want to encourage you to not give up, to never, you know, because I know many times people act as if the continent is a begging continent. When, when we know that we are the continent that powers all the other continents, we're not a begging continent. And we are going to, in our generation, in our time, we're going to change this story in the best way that powers all the other continents without sacrificing ourselves, without sacrificing our 1.3 billion people, their dignity and their prospects. So I look forward to this journey with you and thank you for today. And hopefully we'll call you back in a, in a six months. Now that you're with Southbridge, I'm gonna go read up all about Southbridge. And I'm gonna keep um, contacting Christina so she sends me all the reports of your work, Hathis, so that I can keep up. And so whenever it's a good moment for us to bring you back to our community, we will and we look forward to hearing from you again. So be well and please stay safe because the continent, you know, we have 1.3 billion people, but so many of our people are not aware of the challenges in the way that you are. So we really can't afford to lose you. So just stay safe and stay healthy and keep fighting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hafsa. Thanks, Hafsa. Bye-bye. Bye, 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 Bye Franny. Bye, Hafsa. Bye, Hafsa.